Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, we often talk about climate change as this slow, steady creep, decade by decade warming. Yeah, that's the usual narrative. But the sources you sent over today, this new research, um, especially from places like the Australian National University, it paints a really different picture. It's all about abrupt change. That's exactly it. It's the key distinction. We're looking at studies warning about these sudden, potentially irreversible shifts in Antarctica. And they're not mincing words. They use phrases like catastrophic consequences. They do. And our job today, I think, is to unpack why these changes are so dangerous. And it really boils down to one thing. Everything down there is interconnected. Interlinked systems, okay. These natural systems, the ice, the ocean, the life, that tied together in ways we're maybe only just starting to fully get our heads around. So if we're looking for the biggest, most immediate global threat in this research, we have to start with the ice, right? Which part are they most worried about for a quick, dramatic shift? Uh, the focus immediately lands on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. You'll see it called Waze. Waze. Waze, right. Now, this huge sheet, it's mostly grounded below sea level. Below sea level. Okay, that sounds inherently unstable. It is. That's the crux oh. of the problem. And with CO2 levels climbing, the research really points to the Waze being dangerously close to, well, a tipping point. And tipping points can feel a bit abstract sometimes, but the results of this one... They sound terrifyingly real. What actually happens if the ways destabilizes and, you know, collapses? Well, if that collapse occurs and the scientists are warning, we're closer than maybe we'd like to think. The impact on global sea levels is just staggering. Looks staggering. The loss of just the ways by itself could mean a sea level rise of more than three meters worldwide. Wow. Three meters. Just stop and think about that. That's not adapting. That's redrawing coastlines. Every major coastal city, low-lying nations... Mm -hmm. It changes everything for them. Dr. Narely Abram, she's the chief scientist at the Australian Antarctic Division. She called this exact scenario catastrophic consequences for generations to come. That's strong language from a scientist. It absolutely is. Mm -hmm. And when they use words like that, you have to listen. It forces you to shift how you think about this. Yeah, away from the slow creep model. Exactly. We're used to modeling, you know, millimeters of rise per year. This scenario suggests we could lose control over the ice sheet's stability entirely. And then the rise is just locked in, regardless of what we do later with emissions. That's the implication. It becomes a committed reality. Okay. Let's dig into the how, the mechanics. The study mentions rapid change is already being seen. Ice, oceans, ecosystems. What are the key connections? What's driving the shift from gradual to abrupt? Well, what's really concerning is that it seems to get worse with every fraction of a degree of warming. It's not like things fail one by one in isolation. They feed into each other. Yes, exactly. They reinforce each other's decline. We're seeing these feedback loops starting to really kick in and accelerate the whole process. Can you walk us through one of those loops? The research mentions Antarctic sea ice loss as a key abrupt change. That feels like a big, obvious starting point. It really is. Think of it as the first domino. Losing that sea ice has multiple really profound effects downstream. Okay. First, there's the physical role it plays. It acts like a buffer, a protective shield around the continent. Right, protecting the bigger ice structures. Precisely. When that huge area of floating sea ice disappears, the floating ice shelves, these are the bits attached to the land ice. Holding it back, they suddenly become exposed to the open ocean. Ah, so the sea ice usually takes the hit from waves and storms. Exactly. It dampens all that energy. Yeah. Take the sea ice away, ah. and suddenly those massive permanent ice shelves are facing the full force of ocean waves. Which makes them more likely to break up. Much more susceptible to what they call wave-driven collapse. And critically, if those shelves break apart... Then the glaciers behind them just flow faster. They lose their stopper. The huge glaciers they were holding back, the ones that contribute to the ways, they can start pouring into the ocean much faster, unrestrained. Okay, that's a direct physical link. What's the second effect of losing sea ice? Yeah. Something about heat. Yeah, that's the albedo effect, the reflectivity problem. Ice, especially with snow on it, is incredibly reflective. It bounces sunlight, solar heat, straight back into space. Keeps things cool. Right. But the open ocean, it's dark. It absorbs heat really well. So less ice means more dark water, means more heat absorbed. Exactly. The exposed water sucks up much more solar heat, which then warms a the region even more. Which melts more ice. And you get this self-perpetuating cycle. More warming, less ice, more warming. It feeds itself. The research uses a pretty chilling word here, unstoppable. It suggests that if we stay on the current path, losing these key ice shelves could soon be unavoidable. 
What does soon mean in this context? Are we talking centuries? It's faster than that, potentially. While pinning down exact timing depends on how fast we warm the planet, the research suggests we are getting dangerously close to a point where even massive global efforts might not be enough to stop these specific parts of the ice sheet from disintegrating. Because the process has gained too much momentum. Largely, yes. Because those key ice shells become destabilized. Mm. We're likely talking decades, not centuries, where we might cross that threshold of losing control. The ANU team, for example, really focused their modeling on understanding these fast feedback loops and identifying where those critical limits lie. Okay, so we've got the ice collapsing, driving sea level rise. That's the big physical story. But let's shift gears a bit. What about the non-ice impacts, the biological cost? These abrupt changes must be hitting the Southern Ocean's ecosystems hard. They are. And this is where you start to see the tragedy play out for individual species. The, uh, the risk of extinction for emperor penguins, for instance, is getting significantly higher. It's a heartbreaking example of the sudden change. Why emperors specifically? What makes them so vulnerable to losing sea ice? Their entire life cycle is basically built around stable sea ice. They breed on it, raise their chicks on it, all through the Antarctic winter. And the chicks need that stability? Critically, yes. The chicks have this downy fluff. It's not waterproof yet. They need to stay on that solid sea ice platform for several months until they grow their waterproof feathers. So if the ice breaks up too early... Which is happening more frequently now... Yeah. The chicks just aren't ready. They haven't fledged, they fall into the freezing water, they drown, or they freeze on smaller flows. And we're not talking about just a few chicks. No, we're talking catastrophic breeding failures. Mm. Researchers have actually seen entire colonies effectively wiped out for a season because the ice broke up too soon. Entire colonies? Wow. Yeah, and some colonies have had this happen multiple times just in the last decade or so. Years where basically no chicks survive. Mm. That kind of repeated failure? Well, it's just not sustainable for a population. And I assume the risk goes way beyond just the emperors, iconic as they are. Oh, absolutely. The entire marine food web down there is feeling the pressure. It starts right at the bottom. With krill. With krill, yeah. yeah. They are the absolute cornerstone species feeding whales, seals, other penguins. And they are hugely dependent on sea ice, too. How so? Well, the algae that krill feed on grows on the underside of the sea ice. Less sea ice, less food for krill. Yeah. But it's even more fundamental than that. Go on. The very base of the food web, the phytoplankton, these tiny plant-like organisms, they're also being hit by the warming ocean and by ocean acidification, which is another consequence of absorbing all that CO2. They're the engine of the whole system, right? They are. They're the primary producers. Yeah. And their productivity is under serious stress from multiple angles. Okay, this feels like it's leading towards maybe the most complex, but potentially the most profound finding in these sources. This idea of the deep ocean circulation system potentially collapsing. The Antarctic overturning circulation. Can you break that down? Why is it so vital? Right, the overturning circulation. It's, uh, think of it like the planet's giant ocean conveyor belt. It's driven by really cold, really salty, dense water sinking down around Antarctica. And that drives currents globally. It helps drive currents globally, yes. Uh -huh. But its absolute crucial role, especially in Southern Ocean, is about distributing nutrients. Nutrients, okay, help me visualize that. Okay, imagine the deep ocean floor is like the ocean's pantry. It's where all the essential nutrients think nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, stuff washed off land over millennia, settling gets stored. Right. Down in the dark and cold. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the Antarctic overturning circulation acts like, well, like a waiter. It brings those vital nutrients up from the deep pantry back to the sunlit surface waters, the dining room, where life happens. Ah, uh, so the phytoplankton, the krill, everything needs that waiter to bring up the food. Precisely. The entire surface ecosystem, from the tiniest plankton up to the whales, relies on that constant resupply of nutrients from the deep. And the threat is, what if that circulation, that conveyor belt, slows down or stops? If it falters, yeah. If that overturning weakens significantly, those nutrients get trapped down in the deep ocean pantry. They don't make it back to the surface. So the surface ecosystem starts to starve? Essentially, yes. The biological system at the surface, which is already stressed by warming and acidification, begins to run out of food. It's a profound potential shift. And there's a growing concern that previous models might have underestimated just how sensitive this deep circulation is to all the extra fresh water pouring in from melting ice. So melting ice doesn't just raise sea level, it messes with ocean density and slows the waiter. That seems to be the mechanism. Yeah. And the worry is that this slowdown in deep circulation 
is showing signs of being another one of those critical tipping points that might be closer than we thought. Okay, so just to recap, we've got potentially unstable ice sheets, collapsing penguin colonies, a food chain under stress, and now the risk of the whole nutrient delivery system failing. Pulling this together for the listener, what are the big immediate global consequences if these Antarctic systems really start to break down? Well, the global connection is kind of twofold. It hits us on carbon and it hits us on climate directly. Let's start with carbon. Okay. The Southern Ocean, as it functions now, is one of the planet's most important carbon sinks. It absorbs a huge amount of the CO2 we pump into the atmosphere. Right. It acts like a giant sponge soaking up our emissions. A massive sponge, exactly. Yeah. But a warmer Southern Ocean, and especially one where that overturning circulation has slowed down, which means less oxygen gets mixed into the deep water too, becomes much less efficient at absorbing CO2. So the sponge gets clogged. Or smaller. Its capacity drops significantly. Its efficiency as a carbon sink goes way down. Okay, that sounds really bad. <laughs> that means the natural safety net we rely on to buffer climate change yeah. starts failing us. It does. And that has a, a couple of major implications. First, it suggests that the climate models we use to predict future warming and set targets might actually be too optimistic. Because they assume the ocean keeps helping us out at the current rate. They often do, yes. So if that ocean sink weakens, we might warm faster than projected. Second, it directly means more intense warming worldwide. If the ocean absorbs less CO2, more stays in the atmosphere, driving up global temperatures faster. The pressure on us to cut human emissions becomes even greater immediately. Right. So that's the carbon budget failure. What about the more direct regional impacts? Professor Matthew England was quoted on this. Yeah, he made the point that while obviously rising sea levels from Antarctic melt will affect all coastal communities globally. Mm -hmm. The regional warming effect caused by losing Antarctic sea ice, that albedo effect we talked about, will likely hit Southern Hemisphere nations disproportionately hard. So places like Australia, New Zealand, South America, Southern Africa. Exactly. For countries like Australia, they can expect knock-on effects. Changes to rainfall patterns, more extreme weather events, yeah. partly driven by these massive disruptions, starting way down south of the Southern Ocean. It really is a cascade, isn't it? It's not just an environmental issue happening far away. It's connecting directly to global economics, security, geopolitics. It absolutely is. So as we start to wrap up here, what's the bottom line from the researchers on the policy side? Can existing frameworks like the Antarctic Treaty handle this? Are they enough? Well, Dr. Abram addressed this directly. She said things like the Antarctic Treaty System are vital, critically important for protecting the continent from mining, from conflict, from direct exploitation. But they weren't designed for climate change. Exactly. They simply weren't set up to manage the global issue of climate change impacts arriving at Antarctica from the outside. Uh -huh. So while essential, they're not sufficient to prevent these climate-driven tipping points we're now facing. Which means we have to tackle the root cause. It comes back to emissions, doesn't it? What's the critical limit the science keeps pointing to, to avoid triggering these abrupt changes? The conclusion from this research is pretty unambiguous, really. It confirms what we've heard from the broader climate science community. The only real lever we have left yeah. is to cut greenhouse gas emissions globally fast enough and deep enough to limit global warming to as close to 1.5 degrees Celsius as possible. 1.5, that's the number. That's the number. Going significantly beyond that, even by a few tenths of a degree, dramatically ramps up the risk of pushing these Antarctic systems, the waste, the ocean circulation, past their point of no return, triggering those unstoppable changes. So the message here for everyone listening, whether you're in government, business, or just thinking about your community, is that planning for future climate impacts can't just assume gradual change anymore. No, you have to factor in the potential for these rapid, nonlinear shifts coming out of Antarctica. They're already being observed now. We can't plan for a slow motion crisis when the evidence points towards sudden breaks. We need to adapt our thinking fast to the reality that these huge interconnected systems are maybe more fragile than we assumed. That seems to be the clear message. OK, so here's the final thought we want to leave you with today. If these vast marine ecosystems depend entirely on that Antarctic overturning circulation, bringing nutrients up from the deep. Uh -huh. And we now learn that system might be much more sensitive to warming, much closer to a tipping point than we thought. Uh -huh. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? 
what other absolutely essential, maybe hidden global systems could be atmospheric, could be on land, might also already be showing those worrying signs, systems that we haven't quite identified yet or fully understood their fragility. That's the challenge of these interconnected systems, isn't it? The unknown unknown. Exactly. The challenge of interconnectedness. Something to think about. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.